Hey kids, it's your old Uncle Doug, and guess what? It's National 8-Track Tape Day! God, who thinks of this stuff? And to celebrate, for the last 45 minutes, I've been recording myself into an 8-track recorder. It's totally old school. That's school with a K. Check this out. Okay, feed the 8-track in here. Pull down this giant lever, and oh, oh this is going to be great! Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey there, money nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what a wild and crazy show we have for you. Today, we welcome talking about her new hit video starring SNL star Kate McKinnon. It's New York Times bestselling author Beth Kobliner. Plus, are millennials ditching their advisors? One new study says they are. We'll get the scoop today because from J.D. Power & Associates, we welcome Mike Foy. We're also reaching deep into the mailbag to catch up on your letters. We're throwing out the Haven Lifeline, and heck, we're throwing out all the stops and handing over a fresh slice of my trivia. And now, two guys who are the real-to-real guys of this podcast Joe and O J J J J G. Did you have reel to reel when you were in school? <laughs> Not when I was in school, but my dad had a reel to reel. I found it in the basement. I remember this distinctly. We were just talking about this with OG's mom a couple weekends ago when she was here. I found all this stereo equipment that my dad bought after he got home from Vietnam uh, when I was a kid. And so we hooked it all up and it had, you know, like the who on reel to reel. Oh, awesome. oh, that it's type of reel to reel. I was talking like film strip things. Did you guys have oh. film strips in school? Oh, uh, where they'd, where, where they'd reel in the projector and this big thing and they'd take yeah, it off and they'd, yeah, and probably, and, and you'd have yeah. somebody put the film in. And I remember this stuff that film would start going and it would make this tick, 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 tick yep. noise. And I would say about, Two and a half minutes into every film strip we ever had in school, I was out. I was out cold. I would. It's that rhythmic. That's, oh yeah. That's white noise machine now. Oh in yeah. Your bedroom. Tick 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 tick. And you're like, and I'm out. It was so. I thought you were talking about real to real the music. Well, we were talking about eight tracks, so I thought maybe you talked about music. It was so great. Hey everybody, I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe money on Twitter, just so you know which voice is which. And across the table from me, the guy with his own Twitter handle, and he couldn't be more pleased about it and willing to tell us i roll on my part the one and only i roll emoji oh gee <laughs> yep i'm on twitter i won't even give it away this time so <laughs> fine oh but you know what i've had lately we had these philly cheesesteaks from uh, blue apron today's uh episode is brought to you by blue apron and i'm telling by you cheesesteaks so, so, so yeah by the philly cheesesteaks from blue apron when i get my blue apron order we we put them according to like which one we're most excited about. And the Philly cheesesteak just, I'm like, eh, oh, okay. Made that the third one. Should have made it the first one because it was so awesome. But this episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron's treating Stacky Benjamin's listeners to $30 off your first order. If you visit blueapron.com slash SB. So check out this week's menu and get your $30 off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash SB. And if they offer you the Philly cheesesteak, just say yes. Do it. Yes, 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 yes. Do it. We're also uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. brought to you by Magnify Money. And you know what? The average person saves 450 bucks by changing over those rotten credit cards you're using. Clean out your wallet. Get stuff that better and matches your lifestyle. Don't just walk into the bank and say, what do you got? Head to Magnify Money, where over 92% of the stuff, whether it's checking accounts, savings accounts, credit cards, consolidation loans, auto loan, student loan consolidation, whatever it might be, it's there. We also like, by the way, the blog over at Magnify Money. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. Speaking of that, tomorrow on our Facebook Live over on the Facebook page, OG, Mandy Woodruff, who's the editor-in-chief of that Magnify Money blog, and she also is the co-host of the Brown Ambition podcast. She's going to be our guest over there. Mm -hmm talking about that so mandy used to be with a long time for a long time she was with yahoo finance you'd see her all over yahoo finance so great to have mandy joining us tomorrow but today we've got beth kobliner 
coming down to the basement, New York Times bestselling author, Beth Kobliner, who teamed up with an SNL star, Kate McKinnon, to make a video. How does a money geek who is a friend of ours get Kate McKinnon? <laughs> and, and nothing is Beth Kobliner because if anybody... Like five degrees of separation to Kevin Bacon. Right, right. Is it, uh, is it you, like you, we can connect to SNL. All we need is just like one financial blogger. You and I are three steps away from Kate McKinnon. From being on SNL. <laughs> we're, we're, the way I look at it. We're so close. Right. So while we dream about that, why don't we also bring people some awesome headlines? Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline today comes to us from Investment News. This is written by Mark Schaff Jr. Department of Labor fiduciary rule sparks charges of reverse churning. I, I read reverse churning. I'm like, what the hell's that? This is so funny. As more I've broker a, dealers, I've got a strong opinion about this. As more broker dealers move clients from commission based accounts to those that charge annual fees. In some cases, as a way to ensure they're complying with the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule, they may be in danger of exposing themselves to reverse churning charges. Commissions are seen as a more conflicted compensation method than fees, but if clients don't execute many investment purchases, a firm is likely to generate higher revenue if it puts them in accounts to charge annual fees. So let's go through this. So if I charge you a fee every time I trade, I get hit with a commission. There's a fee for that if I'm an advisor. On the other side, if there's an asset-based account, there's a fee that automatically comes out maybe once a month, once a quarter, based on whatever the per annual percentage is that the client and I have agreed on. The advisor still pays for trades whenever they trade that account. Sometimes. And the broker will pay for trades. Somehow there's going to be some fee associated with the trade. And so there's some clients going, hey, wait a minute. You don't trade at all, which means you're just trying to maximize your damn fee, right? Is, is that what's going on? Well, kind of, sort of. Most platforms these days don't really charge a lot to the advisor in terms of trading costs. Certainly, there are products and different platforms, and I can't speak to all the companies out there, but, uh, but there's certainly some that do cost money to the advisor. By and large, most people don't use those, right? There's transaction-free funds on your platform and that sort of thing. What they're talking about here is this just completely asinine double standard, right? So the whole Department of Labor rule comes out and says, you can't use commissions because commissions are bad for consumers, right? So what does everybody do? Everybody, and this is everybody meeting all the companies, right? They say, we get, we're getting rid of commission accounts. Everybody now has to go to fee accounts because freaking G just said, we can't charge commissions anymore because that's bad for consumers, right? So what about all your clients that do the right thing, right? What about all the advisors that do the right thing and don't trade in client accounts, right? Right. And say, hey, no, we've got a beautifully diversified investment allocation. I'm here to monitor it and rebalance it maybe once a year or, or maybe, you know, like in 2017, everything went up. Right. You know, people ask me, well, hey, why didn't we rebalance last year? Because everything went up. There wasn't the gap that required the rebalancing. But in any event, so now the state departments of, of investment and the attorney generals in all these different states are now saying, wait a second, this is costing clients more than just leaving them in commission accounts. <laughs> so you either have to now trade in that account if you're an advisor and do the wrong thing for the client so that you don't get in trouble by the regulators for not charging commissions. It's so gosh darn frustrating. Well, and this particular thing, I don't think is attorney generals in the States. This particular piece anyway, is a complaint filed against Edward Jones and three other advisory firms in a class action lawsuit. So this is a law firm and some clients saying that because they've been moved from commission-based accounts into fee-based accounts between 2013 and 2018, and they did very little trading, that the asset-based account, to your point, wasn't more advantageous to that particular consumer. Which, again, is totally ridiculous to look at it from the perspective of a really short time frame of, but I should have traded more. The right thing right. to do was to not trade. Right. And so... On one hand, you've got half of the world saying commissions are evil, so we must go to fees. Which, right? by the way, then, which, by the way, then, if there's an advisor up front, if, if there's an advisor in the relationship and the advisor charges you a fee one time up front 
and then doesn't charge you again. I remember all of the fallout over that, right? All the, oh my there's, God, there's, there's a downsides to that. What, what would be the downside as a business owner, right? <laughs> you go, well, why, why, why do I, I can't spend time with you anymore. Like there is no, I've sold you your pair of shoes. You don't get to come in every week and get new shoes now. Like you'd have to buy new shoes for me to like want to help you try on new shoes again. Right. It's like, right. you don't get to just show up at the ice cream stand, <laughs> get free ice cream for the rest of your life. Cause you bought one ice cream cone. Right. right? <laughs> it's just not how it works. Right. So, right. But still, I think it's funny. I think it's funny that there was this huge blow up over that. I mean, talking oh, about yeah. that, I understand your point of view, which is it ain't about the damn trade. It's not about the trade. It's about how do we do the right thing? Right. Do the right thing. How do we? Somebody's got to find some fault because everybody's got an angle. Right? It's a, so it's, it's amazing. Attorneys general, it's the plaintiffs' attorneys in this case that are like, "Hey, we don't care. Have commissions, have fees, doesn't matter. We'll figure out a way to sue you either way." Hey, you charge my clients commissions and you traded a lot. You should have been in a fee account. We're gonna sue you. Hey, you didn't trade enough. My clients are in a fee account. You should have put them in a commission account. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, do the right thing for clients as an advisor, do the right thing and everything else will work itself out. Stephen Rabbit's a partner at Struk, Struk and Levon says it puts institutions in a real bind. I find it hard to believe there would be an untoward push to one business model or another, just because there's a transition doesn't mean there's a per se problem. And that's what Edward Jones also asserts. Edward Jones, this is a quote from spokesman uh, John Bowl from Edward Jones. Edward Jones has consistently offered both fee-based and commission-based client accounts that adhere to all regulatory requirements. We believe Edward Jones client accounts are among the best options in the industry, and we intend to vigorously defend this action. I groaned the second I saw that. There's somebody suing something for everything. <laughs> Just new to me. Hey, you're churning my account. Hey, you're not churning my account. Like, yeah, churn it, damn it. <laughs> Churn. <laughs> it's so it's so crazy. And in our second headline, JD Power recently released its 2018 US full service investor satisfaction study. The study surveys people of all ages, but this year there's some surprising news about millennials who it seems are the least loyal group of full service investors. And joining us over here on My Dad Shortwave is Mike Foy from JD Power. Mike, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, glad to be here. So this could be a big problem for financial firms, couldn't it? It looks like, am I getting this right? It looks like about a third of all millennials say they're considering leaving their financial advisor in the next 12 months. Yeah, that's right. We know that millennials are not only entering their peak earning years, but they also stand to be significant beneficiaries from the $30 trillion wealth transfer, obviously, that's going to be coming over the next couple of decades. So clearly a challenge that firms face is how to how to not only attract, but how to retain these clients over time. That seemed like a huge number, but couple that with another number from your study, only 4% of investors in older generations looking at leaving. What do you think the disconnect is, Mike? Did you guys look into that? Yeah, we did. You know, I think obviously most folks uh, in older generations are more likely to have had a longer tenured relationship, both with their firm and their advisor. You know, even at equivalent levels of satisfaction, we found that most of them are not really looking to leave their firm unless their advisor, you know, moves from firm to firm. The opportunity to attract those clients for firms is really, it's very challenging. With millennials, even the ones who have fairly high levels of satisfaction, uh, many of them are still leaving their options open. They're looking around. They may have a, a secondary self-directed account in addition to their advised account. They're much more likely to be trying out you know, emerging technologies like robo-advisor. So I think there's a number of factors, but clearly this is a group that's keeping their eyes and their options open and hasn't really fully committed yet to... Uh, to a particular firm. Well, when you're talking about things like robo advice, that was my gut feeling was, you know, younger people so comfortable with technology. Yet when I looked at your study, it said that while people are excited about technology, what they're really thirsting for, it sounds like Mike is more and better communication from a human. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it was interesting because we obviously are paying a lot of attention as many people are to emerging aspects of the investor experience related to things like, you know, mobile apps and the, and the digital experience. We did find that that while those things are important 
for clients in terms of firm selection and in terms of, of overall satisfaction, when we actually look at those loyalty numbers, so folks intending to consider leaving their firm, the things that really kind of mitigated that risk were much more about the strength of that relationship with the advisor. Even for younger folks, they're really looking for advisors who are communicating regularly with them and proactively, who are responsive when they reach out to their advisor, and specifically who are helping them with things like setting goals and and helping them feel like they're understanding whether they're on track to achieving goals. Things like providing transparency around things like performance and fees. So yeah, the strength of the connection and the communication with the advisor was really the strongest way that firms have to, again, to keep those millennials loyal as their wealth grows over time. Is there a difference in the way millennials want to be contacted versus older generations, Mike? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. What we didn't see that we expected we might was that they didn't want to be contacted as often. So I think there's a kind of a myth out there that millennials just want to deal with digital and that they don't want as much contact. There was a high demand for for contact, but there was also a much more positive response from millennials to contact through, you know, call them emerging or digital channels, right? So advisors in many cases are just dipping their toe in the water when it comes to things like texting, social media, video, Those are things that the industry has kind of been a late mover on, partly because of compliance and regulatory concerns, partly because of the demographics of clients and of advisors. But what we do see is that, particularly among millennials, when their advisors are using those kinds of channels to increase the levels of contact with them, the investors are responding very, very positively from a satisfaction and loyalty perspective. I was excited to see that because I just think that the human touch is something that can't be easily replaced. But I would be remiss if obviously this is the 2018 version of your full service investor satisfaction study and you studied different firms. I wish I had a drum roll, Mike. Which firm got it right more than any other firm when it came to investor satisfaction? Yeah, so this year, Charles Schwab was our overall winner when it comes to the uh, overall satisfaction score. Uh, This is the third year that Schwab has been our top performer in a row, so that's a great accomplishment for them. I should hasten to add that it was a very close finish, so other firms, including Edward Jones and Stiefel Nicholas, a company that has grown from a regional player into a much larger player in the last few years and probably doesn't have as much kind of brand name recognition as some of the others, we're in second and third respectively. So um, it's a very competitive space, but uh, yeah, Charles Schwab was our overall winner. Last question, by the way, I noticed the numbers were higher this year, just across the board. Do you think that's because It was a year of very little volatility versus the kind of volatility we're going through now. Like, do you find that people are generally happier with their advisor when there's not much going on? Absolutely. Our survey was based on results from December of uh, 2017. And so um, if you think about the market last year, yeah, low volatility, high returns. Just to put it in some perspective, you know, the overall satisfaction average uh, score went up by 20 points. The satisfaction with investment performance specifically went up by 39 points, so almost double that. So I think you're spot on that the low volatility, high return markets last year kind of gave everybody a lift in terms of satisfaction scores. Where do people go, Mike, if they want more info, if they want to dig in further into the numbers? Yeah, so they can go to our site, uh, jdpower.com. We've got a press release with a lot of detail as well as a full list of all the firm rankings from this year's study. Mike Foy, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Interesting. So many millennials, OG, saying, I'm ditching my advisor, and it doesn't come down to technology. It comes down to advisors going, "Eh," and this is my my take, advisors going, oh, they're young. I don't need to talk to them that much. I'll talk to my older people that have a lot of assets. Not the case. Your millennial clients want to get service also. Yeah, you got to have a good service model for different tiers, right? If you look at every successful service business out there, they have different relationship 
levels and different service models that go with each one, it's got to fit both, right? It's got to be successful for your client and it's got to be successful for your business as well. And I think there's a way to do that, but the but you can't just not do anything and expect uh, people to hang around. And I think that's uh, the big lesson from our second uh, piece there with Mike Foy, a lesson from our first piece. Churn, baby. Make it, make it rain. <laughs> Heads up, everybody. We're about to start churning. Advisors in the audience, go churn accounts so Do you don't it. get sued. So you don't get sued. Beth Kobliner has been writing, researching, and talking about money issues for 30 years as a commentator, a journalist. She, of course, is the author of two New York Times bestsellers, OG, Get a Financial Life, Personal Finance in Your 20s and 30s. And the last time she came down to the basement, she was talking about her other hit book uh, last year, Make Your Kid a Money Genius, Even If You're Not. And Beth, we're so excited. She now has a new project. Well, let's let her talk about it. Beth Kobliner. And coming down the stairs, Beth Kobliner. Beth, how are you? I'm good. Joe, you've cleaned the place a little bit. <laughs> no, mom cleaned the place, which oh, is awesome. Of course she did. Absolutely. You can't have us cleaning it. Come on, Beth. That's but true. you, for Financial Literacy Month, you did something really, really cool. Tell everybody what you did, because this is so awesome. You know, I've been writing about this for quite a while, about personal finance, about saving, investing. One of the things I really noticed is that it's a topic that causes people to feel sometimes anxious or overwhelmed and generally frees up. And so the best icebreaker in the world I could think of was Kate McKinnon, who is just from SNL. She's so funny. She's so smart. I thought if I can get her to talk to kids about their money and we can get something funny going, it will bring awareness to the idea that we have to talk to our kids of all ages about money basics. And she did that and it was amazing. Well, well, but wait, hold on a second, Beth. So that would be my first thought too. Boy, if I could get Kate McKinnon to do a video (laughs) with me, that would be great. If we get Kate McKinnon to come down here in the basement with the two of us, That'd be awesome. But how the I know. how the hell did she, you get Kate McKinnon to do your video with you? I have a friend who used to work at SNL and I found out that they have a production company. It was like total amazing stars aligning and she cared about this issue. She thought it was important. And, you know, she was so, so good with kids too. I mean, she really gets it. So it was just one of those fortuitous things that will never happen again. It's definitely my 15 minutes of fame, just standing right next to her. But it also hammered home. It was real kids, which makes it really funny. And they're not like scripted conversations. They're, you know, she's sort of riffing with kids about where do you save and what's money and where do you get money and what's a credit card? And they, the kids were so hilarious without trying to be hilarious. I want to ask you a bunch of questions about that. But before we do that, let's play people a little bit of uh, your clip that we'll link to on our show notes and we'll give people your website address also. But let's listen. This is SNL's uh, Kate McKinnon and Beth Kobliner talking uh, (laughs) money with kids. What's the best thing that you could spend your money on? Candy. No. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. You know what money is. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of money in my boot. In money? your room? No, in my boot. In your boot? It's like a piggy bank, except it's a boot. Oh, oh. so I will put my money in this. Okay. High five for that. We'll begin with just, you know, what prize do you want? <laughs> the big glasses. That'll be eight tickets, please. I don't have enough. We have a situation. I could give you the glasses if you choose to take out a loan. That means I'm going to lend you two tickets, but then you have to come back to my house next week with nine tickets. Here to explain more about that is New York Times bestselling author Beth Kobliner. Hi, guys. Kate's offer may sound great, but be careful when you borrow. It can cost you lots of extra tickets come payback time. See you later. (laughs) Costs a lot of extra tickets, Beth. 
yeah. How do you teach? How do you talk to kids about this issue? And I feel like the video is, I mean, just only 100% because of Kate McKinnon. She's so funny, but it's a conversation starter. You know, parents are scared to talk about money. They feel like we've all made mistakes of our own and we don't want to pass it along to our kids. And that's why I think it's such a great time with Financial Literacy Month here. Start those conversations. You know, it's funny, your video and you talking about debt reminds me of a time when I gave a talk at a high school. I actually didn't give a talk. It was kind of an ask me anything. They put Mm. me up in front of these juniors and seniors and said, hey, Joe's a recovering financial planner. Go ask him some (laughs) questions about money. And every single question, Beth, was kind of along the same lines. I mean, these are much younger children, but their questions were along the same line. Every single question seemed to be, how do I get myself in debt up to my eyeballs as fast as Mm. possible? Like, what's the best way to get a car loan? What's the best way to buy a house? What's the best way to buy? What's the best way to get stuff I can't afford? It was really scary. Right. And I think when you start talking to kids about this young, I mean, I've even seen with millennials, you know, people in their 20s now, they have less debt, statistically speaking, than previous generations, certainly my generation, Generation X had when they came out of college. And I think they're talking and explaining and making it clear, like, this is a bad deal. No matter what, you're paying more for something if you aren't able to pay for it out of your pocket now. And that's a pretty clear concept that when you make it clear to a child, they'll get it. And if you repeat it enough and you start using cash in front of your kids and explain, you know, a credit card is really the same as cash you're paying. But with a credit card, it could be even that much more expensive because you'll pay interest on top of it. Those are the conversations that, you know, we forget to have with kids, mostly because we're not going into stores anymore. We're ordering everything online. We're not going into banks or banking online. So it's sort of forcing yourself as a parent to start being more mindful of the fact that you need to point out those everyday moments to your kids about money because they happen less often. Is that the first conversation that we have, let's say, with young kids? Or is it about how much money you can stuff into your boot? I thought that was hilarious, by the way. (laughs) I know. This little girl saved in her boot. It's amazing. I think it's just the notion of delayed gratification that, and you don't use that term, you say we save, you know, we wait, first of all, we wait for the swings, we wait for, you know, the holidays to come along, we wait for our birthday, we have to wait and save up for something we want. And when we walk home from school, we can buy a snack, but if we don't buy the snack, we could take that money and put it in our piggy bank or boot or jar or whatever at home and then save up for something we really want. And I think just, Giving a kid that responsibility of, yep, you can have that, but you first have to save to get it, that really has a powerful impact on kids. So I think that's the one that, you know, and of course we know from the marshmallow experiment that kids who wait, you know, when you were given, kids were given one marshmallow and they said, you can eat it now, but if you wait, you can get a second marshmallow. And those kids they found who waited a full 15 minutes to get a second marshmallow, those were the kids they tracked over time and they found they were more likely to say they were happier in their relationships. They had higher SAT T scores, and they even had lower body mass indexes. So we know that waiting and delaying gratification is one real predictor of success in life. And it's so important to sort of hammer that message home as soon as possible. With a little bit older kids, when do we start with allowances and maybe having the bigger money discussions, maybe around family finance? Right. The research shows by age three, kids can understand some basic money concepts like exchange and value. But when it comes to allowance, you can, first of all, the research shows, and I looked at over a dozen studies on this, you don't have to give allowance to be a good financial parent. You can give allowance. And if you do give allowance, you want to do the four C's. You want to be clear. You want to be consistent. You want to give your kids cash because that feels meaningful and tangible to them. And not only that, but it can help them learn to count and add and subtract. And the final C is don't tie allowance to chores. That's an important one because research also shows that when kids do chores without being paid and they start at a young age and their parents really make them do those chores, those kids build up a sense of responsibility and they're more likely to hit milestones like graduating from school and starting a career. So chores without paying kids is important. That is some great advice. 
I'm so happy you could spend a few minutes with us. So when are we seeing you next on SNL, Beth? Well, that's never going to happen, sadly, (laughs) but it was fun while it lasted. And I so appreciated her, you know, being willing to speak to this issue. It's one issue of people of all income levels really want to know how do they help their kids improve their financial futures and their lives. So I felt really lucky and it was really funny. That's awesome. And people can get more resources from your website, right? Right. BethKobliner.com. Awesome. And we'll link to BethKobliner.com and our show notes at StackyBenjamins.com. Congratulations on a fantastic video. Well done. And uh, thanks for spending a few minutes with us. Thank you so much. And I love what you've done to the place. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I am loving this eight-track player recording. Who am I kidding? It's annoying as hell. Nothing like my real personality. Okay. Yeah, there. that's better. Whew. Okay. Anyway, though, here's some eight-track related trivia because that's fun. As a business move, eight-track players were originally developed to be played in what type of vehicle? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. Today's episode of Stacking Benjamins brought to you by Blue Apron. Cheryl and I are learning it's a better way to cook. Blue Apron's the leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. And while many people know what they do, many don't know about the types of meals that you get to eat when you cook a Blue Apron. You're not just having burgers for dinner. You know, we had short rib burgers with a hoppy cheddar sauce on a pretzel bun the other day. (laughs) Hmm. You'll be making seared steaks and thyme pan sauce with mashed potatoes, green beans, and crispy shallots all in under 45 minutes and without a trip to the grocery store. What I like is at the end of the day, it lets me decompress while I make my meal because you got to be focused right on your Blue Apron. Blue Apron's the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country, and its mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. They achieve that by supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. Blue Apron's treating all of us, all the Stacky Benjamins community, to $30 off your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash SB. And when it comes to dinner, let Blue Apron take care of the planning and chopping while you do the cooking and the eating. (laughs) You'll enjoy delicious meals like popcorn chicken with sweet chili cabbage slaw, and cumin spice wonton noodles with vegetables and peanuts. I'm so hungry. On the table in 30 minutes or less, with incredible ingredients and chef-designed recipes, Blue Apron lets you see what the power of food can do. So check out this week's menu and get your $30 off at blueapron.com slash SB. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Hey stackers, we get used to those same daily routines, don't we? Wake up at the same time every morning, brush our teeth, park the car in the same spot at work every day, recite jokes in the mirror to be funnier than that jerk of the water cooler, or is that with just me? Here's one thing you shouldn't make routine, using the same credit card from the same bank just because that's what you've always done. Nick Clements from Magnify Money explains why. I mean, it's never been a better time, honestly, to find a credit card, especially given the lucrative sign-on bonuses that are out there. Chase just recently had 100000 on their reserve card. I, I think we're at a point right now where credit cards are extremely profitable for large banks, and they are really wanting to get more customers, and so they're, they're rolling out the red carpet. So I would just say, if, if you have had a credit card for more than two or three years, chances are there's a much better deal out there for you today. So why stick with that same old card with those rewards that haven't changed in years? You can use MagnifyMoney.com to always find best in class, including better interest rates. And don't only use Magnify Money for credit cards. Nick and the team have built the site from the ground up to help with personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. Average person saves $450 in interest when they hit stackcubedgements.com forward slash Magnify Money. Hey there, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm back with a thrilling conclusion to today's 8-Track Trivia. Here was the question. As a business move, 8-Track players were originally developed to be played in what type of vehicle? The answer? Well, if you said 
sweet purple El Caminos with prime white leather Corinthian interiors and chrome mud flaps. I'd say you've been watching me drive around town, haven't you? On the other hand, if you said jets, you'd be right. In fact, Bill Lear, the guy making Lear jets, currently trying to get me to buy one, but I'm holding out for the right opportunity. They created the eight track with his team because he wanted a better experience for passengers. So because records kept skipping on flights, his engineers came up with the eight track player and eight track tapes. And then air supply became popular and it was all downhill from there. See how good things go bad, people? This is why we can't have nice things. And police and The Who and The Doors. And actually, all those are good good bands. I think he's trying to make a joke there with Jets, Air, and Air Supply. Hmm. Uh, okay. Tough trivia, but I like the story, don't you? If that's how it went. Oh my goodness, stop eating while we record. I'm not eating. <laughs> what are you talking about? It is so gross. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's, or rather, life insurance's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most. Reverse churning and eight tracks. <laughs> I thought you were going to say whatever that sausage was you were eating. Or... It's the world's worst protein bar. It definitely isn't an RX bar, then. It's not. It definitely is not. It's not an RX bar. Tell you that much. It's actually your family and your time they focus on. But that's why they created a simple way to buy affordable and dependable term life insurance online. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free estimate for coverage and learn about life insurance the modern way. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. And you know, it's funny, we've got a lot of questions about life insurance coming up soon. But first, we got this one from Tanya. Say hello, Tanya. Hey guys, since you're on Facebook begging for voicemails, I decided to try it out. My question is about retirement. I am 34. I work at a public library. I currently contribute to the state pension program through OPRS. So that's 10%. I fully fund my Roth IRA each year. And I'm just wondering what should be done after that. There's a 457B um, Ohio Deferred Comp that I could use, or is it best to really just have a brokerage account and get uh, more familiar in investing? Just wondering your thoughts. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Tanya. And we're begging. We're, we're, thank goodness Tanya came through with the voicemail. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday if you send us a voicemail today. <laughs> I thought it was tomorrow. Wouldn't that be great? Actually, it's funny. What I wrote on Facebook was, hey, never a better time than now. We're completely out. So feel free. So you were begging. I was begging. I like going to the 457 next. I like knowing when she's going to retire and what her goals are besides that before she makes the next move. Well, okay, sure. She said retirement. So I'm, I'm assuming retirement, normal age, right? So... Kind of like the idea of 457. Why do you like that? Well, I want to jam pack all those pre-tax things. You know what I mean? So we've got the uh, retirement plan through the state that she mentioned, which is basically in lieu of, probably anyway, in lieu of Social Security. So she's got that kind of, quote unquote, leg of the stool, right? And let's work on the other side, a tax deferred retirement plan. Gives you some flexibility in the future, right? You can retire a little early. You know, I like deferring taxes when yeah. possible. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, thanks for the question, Tanya. We also get letters, and we're going to do some catch up on letters since we didn't talk to Beth for very long today. First letter comes to us from our new friend, Greg. Greg says, hey, Joe and OG, I'd love to hear you guys discuss the pros and cons of minimum volatility funds. Comparing returns of Vanguard's minimum volatility index with either their U.S. total market index or the global index, it seems like the minimum volatility fund outperformed both from mid-2014 to the end of 2017. In up markets, it seemed to keep pace with the gains of the other funds, but in downturns, it didn't go down quite as badly with overall better results and a smoother ride along the way. I would have assumed that in the bull market over the last few years, it would have lost ground to riskier indexes. From what I can tell, minimum volatility funds seem to have a short track record 
Is this a new approach or have these funds been around for a while? I'd love to get your guys' thoughts. Greg, thanks for the question, Greg. Minimum volatility funds, OG. I think he answered his own question here. Greg, you said from 2014 to 2017. There it is. Yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of the entire investing timeframe of all history, it's not even a drop in the bucket. So it's... You can't look at you can't look at that short period of time, and you certainly can't say during the downturns there weren't any downturns from 2014 to 2017. Certainly nothing that's uh, of consequence, right? So we didn't have any bear markets, we didn't have any large recession periods over that time. So you know it's not fair to compare that against you know a little uh, flat period of time in the S and P. The other thing that you want to be aware of too is. Look in the context of what was going on in the world over that period of time and kind of what still is happening. And that is the United States large company investments are leading the pack and have for the last five or six or seven years contrasted against all the rest of the asset classes. So large companies versus small companies versus international, big and small versus emerging market is kind of what I'm thinking here. And so when you look at something that's compared against other S&P 500-esque products, it's going to look real similar. It's kind of hard to screw that up. And so, yeah, it's going to outperform the quote unquote riskier things. But in the context of what, over a three year period where large cap US beat small cap anyway? Well, that's not really a fair comparison. Yeah, the world's- my last, I was going to say my last comment here real quick is, I think this is ridiculous from a philosophical standpoint, right? Minimum volatility funds. Well, why would we want to reduce volatility? Volatility is a thing that produces excess return, right? If you have the lowest volatility product, cash, what do you get for return? Nothing. The next lowest volatility product is treasuries. What do you get for return? Almost nothing after inflation. And, and you kind of go up that pyramid, well, what's the highest volatility product? Technically, small company stocks, right? And what do you get for that? You get rewarded for that volatility. So why would you want to get rid of the thing that's rewarding you for taking it? That's the purpose of volatility. Volatility is what is the trade-off between market returns and treasury. So finally, the last piece, you know, what have they been around a long time? I don't know. This sounds like a marketing name to me more than anything. This is our whiz bang, minimum volatility, long, short, AB growth strategy, index fund analysis, uh, these are all just marketing terms. So they may have some science behind it, but nothing I'm buying. What say you, Mr. Joe? Uh, I, I, I seriously have nothing to add. Ta da! No I'll just go, ta da! <laughs> yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> That's it. Uh, What's that hook in your hand for? You're like trying to pull me off the stage. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Greg. Hey, uh, next question comes to us from Luther. Luther says, What are some alternative methods of investments outside of stocks and real estate? I have some of my money in P2P lending. Luther, looking for some things other than stocks and real estate. Mr. Vandross, nice to hear from you again. Yes, glad uh, you're back. Thank you for writing in. Maybe you could uh, pen us a tune uh, in your spare time. Uh, there are There is nothing else. This reminds me of the article I saw a week or two ago. Uh, actually, I saw a portion of an article from uh, Darren Ravel on Twitter and it was uh, Drew Brees and his wife were suing somebody for selling him $9 million worth of diamonds because he needed to diversify his portfolio. And so uh, uh, Drew Brees says uh, from 2010 to 2016, this person, uh, presumably some sort of advisor, advised my wife and I to allocate funds to an alternative asset class of investment grade diamonds and told us he would use his connections and expertise to acquire them on our behalf below market value. In an effort to diversify our portfolio, we trusted him and invested. He assured us he was being compensated by the sellers for any diamonds he acquired on our behalf. This is getting out in front of your your skis too far, right? Stocks, bonds, real estate, cash. It's all the diversification you need. Yes, there are hedge funds. Yes, there are P2P lending. Yes, there are, gosh, I remember... 10 or eh, it was longer than that, 15 years ago, there was kind of a push toward buying non-publicly traded 
shares and S corps. Like you could list your small business in a marketplace and advisors could look through the financials and go, yeah, I've got somebody that wants in on that. Timberland. Yes, it's a diversifier. Do you need it? Absolutely not. Cash, stocks, bonds, real estate, done. Yeah, I was thinking I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking that uh while there are other asset classes, there's other things that there's other things that you could do. I mean, he could buy a franchise of a business. There's obviously the bond market he can get on the Forex exchange. It just crypto. Yeah, yeah, you I mean there's other stuff, but why? Uh but yep. why? Um yep. yeah. Stick with the two that historically have gotten you there most reliably over nearly every long-term time frame that you can look at, i.e. 10 years or over, stocks and real estate for the win, baby. That's that's pretty much it. Our next letter comes to us from Jason. Jason says, not a question, just an observation. I've been listening to the show for a while now and finally stopped wondering why Joe Len and the team do not fully share their wealth of financial knowledge. Instead, they joke around, fly on the surface, and only occasionally dip down into financial content. Now that I'm savvy to the vibe, I must say I really do love and look forward to the show because a revelation struck me. There are plenty of financial podcasts out there, but Joe's show helps you to clear your head and just have fun. Why do we earn and save? We do it, or we should be doing it, to enjoy life more fully. And what a better way to do it than to laugh and have fun. Keep the show rolling, guys, and please don't adjust the theme. Love it. Thanks, thanks, Jason. And OG, it's about time. I'm wondering why he keeps on referring it to Joe's show. I mean, everybody <laughs> knows that this is Doug's show. That's right. You and I are just here at his, uh, at his serving at his pleasure. And I'm glad that Jason got it because, you know, we try to set people up so they understand what they're getting into. We had a review on Apple Podcasts recently that uh, was about not enough tidbits of information. And and I thought, really? You clicked on a picture of a dude with a bag over his head. And then the show starts off with my mom's neighbor, Hi, Doug. From- introducing it from my mom's half finished basement and you thought this was going to be an ultra serious boring ass thing come on come on so yeah i thought that was funny really you clicked on all that and you still gave me a review about tidbits good for you aren't tidbits those things that you give your dog mm. the little snacks yeah well yeah, those are kibbles and bits. Fun stuff. Uh, next question comes from Rody. Rody says, "Hey there, I'm just finishing up paying off my car. Awesome, Rody. Congratulations. My goal is to buy a different. I'm not using the word new car when my son turns 16. My son will get the car I have now, and I'll get the car I'm able to buy with the money I have. I don't want a loan at this time, so." However much I've saved will be my car budget. I plan to sit aside $600 per month for 30 months, as that's how long until my son turns 16. Knowing I'll cash the whole thing out in 30 months and hoping that it'll gain some kind of interest, where's the best place to put that $600 a month? Thanks for the help. Your show is so much better than, well, insert marginal compliment here. (laughs) That's so good. Thanks, Rody. OG, $600 a month, 30 months. Where do you put that money? Totally 100% has to be cash. Time frame is just too short and the goal is too important to risk half of that going away in market fluctuations, right? So go find yourself a good online savings account on Magnify Money if you don't already have one and uh, dollar cost average into cash, <laughs> set up your systematic transfer and uh, earn your few bucks in interest over the next uh, two and a half years, knowing full well that it goes away. Because here's the risk. If you invest it in stocks, there's a chance that you might come to the table to buy your car with $10,000 instead of 18. You know, you could have that downturn happen right at the wrong time. So can't risk that with this time frame and with this goal. So cash it is. Yeah. I can't imagine with that short of a time frame. It's almost like, you know, I grew up in farm country, OG, and there was a certain time that you planted corn There was a certain time that you harvest corn. So if I told anybody working on the farm that you should harvest the corn when it's just, you know, a month in, a farmer would look at you like you're crazy. And for us, you should do the same thing with your investments. You're crazy if you look at the stock market over a one or two year time frame. You're also crazy to use 
cash for a 20 year time frame. you know, different types of investments have different parameters about when the thing is ripe and nothing outside of cash is going to be ripe into in, in, uh, less than three years. So, and, uh, it's kind of a trip to the casino. OG is really what it is. If we're going to like the casino, mix a bunch of metaphors here. It's a farm. It's a casino. It's, it's a casino farm. It's, a, it's, like, it's like Farmville on Facebook. Oh, yeah. You're making money nonstop there. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Rody, And congratulations on uh, not going into debt for a car. That's a good thing there, too. Uh, Vicky writes to us next. Vicky says, I've asked a big bank for some investment avenues. <laughs> Do you hear the warning bells going off? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Warning. Warning. Vicky, it's all downhill from here. And uh, one of them they've recommended is the Goldman Sachs Momentum Builder Multi-Asset 5S ER Index Link CDs due 2025. There yes. we go. <laughs> there we go. Obviously where you need to put your money. Because if, <laughs> if you can't figure out what the Goldman Sachs Momentum Builder Multi-Asset 5S ER Index Link CDs due 2025 are... What what kind of a good thing you have us? It's a straightforward product, Vicky. <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> Reminds me of that uh, South Park episode where the kid goes to the bank and the and the uh, and, 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 and it's, it's gone. gone. Yes, uh, the purpose of this was a safe way to invest a portion of my account where I wouldn't lose principal. Is this a good product? At the end of seven years, am I likely to have just what I put in, or is there a relatively decent chance of making a little? Or would a regular bank CD for seven years be a better choice? Hoping you have some thoughts. Love your show. It gets me to and from work. Too bad I haven't learned a thing. Well, Vicky, I think the only thing we hope that you learn is, at least on my end, OG, stick with stuff that you can write how it works on a napkin, and you're going to be a lot better off. Yeah. Setting aside the fact that a seven-year goal, you might want to have a little bit more equity exposure than just a CD rate of return. This is way too complicated of a product. I mean, it took you 32 and a half seconds. I timed it to actually say what it is. <laughs> and my guess is, is that it's accompanied by a 250 page prospectus. And they use big fancy words in there that make it sound like it's really, you know, it's shucking and jiving, right? It's like the <laughs> Goldman Sachs. You're like, okay, I know them. The market linked seven year. Like, okay, I'm linked to the market. Gosh, darn. This is far too complicated, not to mention that the person who's selling you this probably gets a nice big fat uh, payday on the back end. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I doubt that was the first lead in. Like, hey, well, I've got this great product for you. The good news is that I get a big commission on this if you buy it. Um, here, just go ahead and look at these 250 page. Oh, well, that's too complicated? Great. Press hard three copies. If you want your money to be around in seven years from now, it's got to be a regular CD or a savings account. Although... Never in a million years would I take a seven-year goal and have that be in a CD or a savings account because – Once again, we go back to the cornfield. You got a time frame there that helps along the way. You can stand to be a little bit more aggressive with that because you've got that time factor on your side. So I would really strongly consider that as well. And kind of tactically, interest rates right now, kind of what do we think? Do we think they're going to stay the same over the next – Coming up. Years? Do we think they're going to go down? We think they're going to go up. I mean, the trend is for them to go up. So if you lock your money in today at a seven-year rate and interest rates rise, you're not going to get that uh, get that bump up. So I think there's something better you can do here. Yeah, I think there is too. And the key to what OG saying from where I sit, Vicky, is you're going to see it bump around a little bit. And just by the way that you wrote, you might worry about that. But really the key is, you know, what back to my cornfield analogy from earlier, you don't sit and watch the corn in the field. You go out and pick it when it's ready. And uh, with a seven year time frame, what OG saying is put it in, don't look at it. Seven years from now, go pick it. And uh, historically, there are very few time frames over a seven year time frame, over a seven year goal where you weren't happy. Now, we would recommend though, in when it comes to the financial markets, they're not all created equal. So we'd stay on what's called the value side, uh, stick with larger companies versus smaller companies that don't bounce around as much. And you know what? Diversification is your friend. So you might want to have some of that be international, some be in the US, but certainly I would diversify it out a little bit. What do you think? No, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole magnitude of areas that you can put this uh, money for a seven-year goal 
that's not the Goldman Sachs market linked 5x blah, 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 2025 thing. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, Vicky. That's all we're going to get to today, but I'm glad we were able to get to a few of these because we're way behind on letters. We're almost as as, as Tanya said, I was I was begging for voicemails. We now have about uh, 11 of those in the queue, so we're still a little ways off again. We go through these spurts, and I just want to let people know that there are times when the queue's empty and you get the front row. So uh, thanks a ton to everybody who's called in, who's written to us, and uh, we're trying to get to them as fast as we can. All right, that's going to do it for today. If you're somebody looking for great help in your corner, guess what? OG's taking clients. And to find out more about how you can get them in your corner, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G. That's it. Coming up on Friday, we got the original three back together. Paula, Len, OG. And guess what? We're talking about sexism. When people talk about money, a very difficult topic that our uh, friend Nikisha, who listens to the show, I met Nikisha in Seattle and she sent it along and, and uh, we, we're going to take a run at this, a little bit deeper topic than we usually do on the Stacky Benjamin Show. And also Kevin Ells from eBlocker is coming. Some people are surprised to find out, OG, that uh, companies watch like what region of the world you live in when you shop at their place and they what uh, type of computer you use when you're shopping for products or services. And Kevin Ells has this uh, cool thing where you can block all that out so you don't have price discrimination against you. So we're going to talk about that, too, on Friday. Good stuff. All right, Doug, tell us what we should have learned today. So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from Beth Kobliner. Teach your children and kids at heart about money and staying out of debt early on, and they'll have a leg up on a lifetime of financial success. Second, looking for good financial help? I think Mike Foy from J.D. Power nailed it. Great advisors are good communicators. Your advisor not communicating with you? Probably time for some better help. But the big lesson... Who scheduled the disco dance party for 8-Track Tape Day? I can't even squeeze into these Jordan jeans. And who borrowed my members-only jacket? Bring it back. Come on, OG. Doesn't even fit you. Special thanks to Beth Kobliner for joining us. You'll find Beth's financial literacy video on YouTube or head to BethKobliner.com for links to that and other financial literacy resources. Thanks also to Mike Foy from J.D. Power for joining us. Check out jdpower.com for more on 2018 full-service financial survey details. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, Consult with a real financial advisor. So we went down to San Antonio for the national championship game a couple weeks ago or a week ago, whatever. 
Yeah, that's kind of a, uh, you know, kind of that uh, moment. Like, uh, besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? Oh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah, it depends on what team you're rooting for. I was not rooting for Villanova. How's that? Although good for them. I mean, really a small, that's, I got to tell you what I like about basketball is that some of these smaller schools that in football, it's so difficult just looking at the numbers of people they have to get to make that type of a program. It's very difficult for a school the size of Villanova to compete that way. And when you can put a team on the floor and, and that's not to take anything away from Villanova athletics or anything at all. Just, I love it. I love it. And the fact that Loyola made it to the final four, just so exciting. Yeah. Well, in any event, super exciting. Yep, super, <laughs> super, super exciting. Um, it's not the narrative you're going with. No, no, they. It, it was a, it was a butt whooping. If you're a Michigan fan, it was a butt whooping. There wasn't anything that uh, that they did uh, well in that game. But anyways, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about on the drive home. So Texas is famous for its 85 mile an hour speed limits in certain areas. Have you driven on any 85 mile an hour speed limit roads? I I love that road from Austin to just outside San Antonio. Right. Okay. So 130 is the highway. So some of that section is 85. They changed it now. Some of it's 80. So it really slowed down. But it's a fun road. There's not a lot of traffic, which is kind of the purpose of it, right? You pay a little toll to go around Austin. You don't have to go through the center of it. We get on the other end of this. So I'm in the left lane and uh, kind of glance. I'm a conscientious driver, right? I, I drive fast, but I like to, you know, shuck and jive a little bit on the road. I, I want to get to where I'm going, right? But I'm observant of other people. And I look in the mirror and I kind of do the double take of, wow, there's a semi truck behind me. I said, okay. And I'm thinking, okay, I got, you know, usually there's not a semi truck in the left lane, but I either need to speed up or, you know, get out of the way, right? And I glance again, and he has closed the gap that was a quarter mile to bumper to bumper in. I think someone's at your door, Joe. <laughs> is that the mailman? This has happened, this yeah. happened all week. Well, no, the workman working outside mom's house, and we can't yeah. stop it. So yeah. it yeah. is what it is. The truck is right behind me. So I move over. You know, I'm, I'm not going to stand in his way. Right? Yeah, right, right. So I move over. This truck blows by me, and I'm thinking... This is like one of those radar gun traps, right? I mean, I'll just travel behind the semi truck. The cop will get the semi truck guy before he's going to get the guy in the car. You sure. Know, the sedan. And so I'm following this guy. We went from pretty much north of Austin to Waxahachie. Waxahachie? Huh? Oh, you're going north 35. on uh, on I-35. 35, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're on a different road than I thought. You're on I-35. Okay. After we get past the toll road. Gotcha. Okay. I thought this was, I thought we were still on the toll road. No, 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 no. Just past it. Just getting on 35. Here comes the semi truck. Honk, honk. I'm not joking. This dude was pulling away from me in a flatbed loaded semi. I was driving 95 miles an hour. And the semi is pulling away from you. Pulling away. And so he passes this car because there's, he's tailgating another car, right? And it's, you know, just young woman driving, a college age woman, and she moves over and he blows by her. Right. And so we're doing our, you know, he's kind of weaving in and out of traffic, not totally like a jack wagon, but but kind of kind of he is in a freaking hurry and he's got a loaded semi truck. Right. And out of nowhere comes this car that he passed like 10 minutes ago. Oh, boy. This young lady. And she's driving like 140. Whoa, and she blows by me and blows by him and gets in front of him. And literally, I'm not exaggerating this. They were bumper to bumper, like Rubbin's racing all the way from like the Bucky's on 35 North to Waxahachie. And anytime she sped up, he sped up, right? Like literally, if she would have brake checked him one second, it would have been over for her. It's one thing to follow this truck, right? And you're like, okay, I'm at a safe distance. Well, what I can assume is a safe distance, but we're still driving 85 miles an hour or whatever. And then I'm thinking, this is going to turn into a giant wreck because semi-trucks can't stop. This 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 car in front of this, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I, I just, I, we were just in awe the entire time as this guy in a semi-truck is tailgating with, feet to spare in front of this little teeny tiny Toyota, whatever. 
And I'm just wondering, was she oblivious or just trying to be a jack wagon and not get run down? I don't know. Those kind of drivers drive me crazy anyway. And what's funny is, is that my son knows it. And when we were driving to Washington, he would continually up and down on the gas pedal. And he'd also hang out in the left-hand freaking lane. Nobody wow. around hanging out. And people are going around him, passing him on the right. On because the right, yeah. for no reason, he's driving four miles under the speed limit in the left-hand lane. And every time he's in the car with me, he hears me. And I've told that story just before. Rage just raging on these people. And my kid's that person. It's yeah. totally that. And and just completely oblivious. And then you say something to him and he gets huffy about it. Oh, oh. I don't want a ticket. Oh, oh. I'm like, what are you doing hanging out left hand line? Oh, a big deal. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. More accidents are caused by that, I think, than by anything else. But, but uh, no, it was mesmerizing for two hours. But if you're listening to the show, Mr. Trucker, and that was you. Up by 35. Thanks for getting Thank us home, Murray. For the escort, because uh, I was in your blind spot for about two hours. You wouldn't have known I was there, but I was drafting you.